sinful man saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Tonight, I was driving here, or not I, my grandma was driving me here, but I was sitting in the passenger seat, and I don't know, I was kind of, I kind of forgot I had to do this, so I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? Just sitting there thinking about it, and I'm like, oh no, 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 no. And then I looked up, and we were on the highway, and there was a bunch of signs up right here, McDonald's, Arby's, Taco Bell, Olive Garden, all that, and then there was rain and clouds here, and then a bright sun here. And my thoughts were, we, as people, are hungry. So we listen to the signs, because a sign means a notice bearing a name, direction, warning, or advertisement that is displayed or posted for public view. Then we listen to that sign to go eat. But when we we have war, and the president, or the runner or whatever, gets an attempted assassination, we ignore that, but we'd rather go listen to a sign that says Applebee's and feed our appetites than a sign that's leading you to heaven. You are, we need to get up out of our tiredness, our sleepiness, our wanting to be doing this all the time when God is showing us signs that you are not even, you don't care. You're like, oh, oh, I don't really care. That's not a big deal. But what you need to do is get on your knees and pray. Because God has given you a sign that you shouldn't ignore. God is coming. He will be here soon. And if you're not ready, I I don't want to think about what would happen to you if you're not ready. You will go to hell or the lake of fire and there will be gnashing of teeth and loneliness and darkness. And that's because you're paying attention to little signs that mean nothing. That you're feeding your appetite. But you need to be listening to the signs that are over here that are not feeding your appetite, that are getting you ready to see Jesus. Why don't we thank Jesus for the signs that he's given us? Thank you, Jesus, for giving us signs to get to heaven. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Jesus.
you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you. We give you glory. Thanks for your mercy and your goodness daily. Hallelujah. tonight as we praise him and worship him and give him all of us. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in what a says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of thine increase, so shall thy bonds be filled with plenty, and thy pres present shall be burst out with new wine. There is a great blessing when we give to God. When we give to God, we, we are faithfully and truthfully, we honor him, how many to we honor him, how many want to honor him. 
Let's read our verses. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Bring her offering cheerfully to him.
Is anyone happy to be in, in the house of the Lord tonight? I don't know about you, but I've been waiting to be here on Friday night all week. It has been long. And I've been praying and praying and praying. But why don't we get out of the aisle and shake somebody's hand, someone that you haven't seen, and give them the biggest smile. Tell them how God has maybe even changed your life this week. Why don't we, why don't we greet one another? Praise the Lord, everybody. How many are happy to be in the house of the Lord on a Friday night revival service? All right, I'll try that again now that everybody's listening. How many of you are happy to be in the house of the Lord on a Friday night revival service? Any young people happy to be in the house tonight? Amen. Amen. It is a delight to see each and every one of you here. And I love each and every one of you. I'm ready to have church tonight. Is anybody ready to have church? Oh, come on. We can do better than that. Is anybody ready to have church? I am going to do my best tonight to follow the Holy Ghost. So if we could open our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 17. I'll be honest with you, young people. I am feeling a little under the weather, and I do my best to not let that hold me back tonight. But I do feel, now this may change, but right now I do feel that some of this may be more teaching than preaching. And I don't know how many of you have heard Bishop say this, but way back, I've heard him say it for a while, but way back, Bishop used to say the difference between preaching and teaching is how far the spit went. <laughs> From maybe the first row, if it was teaching, if it's preaching, maybe it's the third or fourth row. And uh, he never said this, but back in the day, preaching also involved how far he would throw the water at you. <laughs> Many of you haven't seen that, but uh, Bishop was known to chuck a full glass of water at you, and uh, you'd be shouting and dancing to get with the preacher, and then you'd just be blessed from heaven, and you'd be wondering where that came from, but I do, I have felt this on my heart all week long, and so I'm going to do my best to follow.
follow the Holy Ghost through this. We're going to begin at verse number one. The Bible says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. Everybody say, apart. And was transfigured before them. And the title I give us for the sake of remembrance tonight is this, The Mountain and the Mustard Seed. The Mountain and the Mustard Seed. Why don't we pray, young people, and let's ask that God would speak to us in this house tonight. Jesus, thank you for your presence that's in this place. I thank you for your word. I ask that you would anoint these feeble lips of clay, God, that you would give me strength and direction to deliver this word as you would have me to deliver it. I ask that you would give us ears to hear Jesus, that you would give us a heart to receive, that you would give us a mind to understand what you say in this house tonight. Jesus, would you anoint our hands and our feet to go out of this house and to do and to be all that you have called us to be, Jesus. We ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus, and everyone said, in Jesus' name, you may be seated. The mountain and the mustard seed. Last night, my wife and I were sitting outside, um, and we were enjoying the the cooler weather. Thankfully, it kind of cooled off by the time we were sitting outside. And um, I was sitting in the grass holding my son, and my wife was playing with our little puppy. She was throwing the ball, and our puppy was chasing it as fast as her little legs would carry her. As we were sitting there, um, my wife suddenly said, oh my, kind of concerned. And I was like, what? I mean, I don't see anything. And uh, as I looked over to my left, crawling in the grass was a wasp. And he was, you know, average size wasp. He wasn't a giant wasp. He wasn't a little wasp. He's just average size wasp. And I began to watch this wasp as I knew what I was going to be preaching tonight. And I began to watch this wasp as he was trying to crawl up a blade of grass. And he would get almost to the top and he would slide down. And then he would get almost to the top and then he would slide down. And I don't know why, but for whatever reason, there was something on the top of this blade of grass that just wasn't working out with the feet of the wasp, and so he'd get to the same point, and he would slide back. And I feel in the Holy Ghost tonight that there are some people that you have been trying to climb to somewhere that God is calling you, and something has been pulling you back. Is anybody going to help me in the house tonight? That something has been pulling you back, and you haven't quit, you haven't thrown in the towel, but I believe that the Holy Ghost wants to give you something just a little bit extra tonight to help you get to where God has been calling you to. I believe that in this house tonight. In our text, we read about what many call the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, uh, this is, it's kind of debated. Uh, I read both sides of the argument this afternoon and And one side has a lot more evidence than the other, but it's kind of debated if this was one of two mountains in Israel or around Israel. Um, I found it very interesting that Bishop literally ended at Matthew 16 and 28 Tuesday night. And I leaned over to Brother Matthew and I told him, I said, I'm really glad Bishop stopped there because he was really close to preaching my message. And I just took it as confirmation because every once in a while, Bishop and I will discuss what we're preaching, but it's not very often that we get the chance to do that. And so this is the Mount, more than likely this is Mount Hermon. It is the highest mountain in Israel. Um, It's one of the only mountains that receives snow. And one of the reasons why... This is believed to be that mountain is because in the book of Mark, he references that. He references the snow. He makes reference to that. Uh, The other mountain that they think it is, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. It's running from me. But it is not as high 
of a mountain. And also during Jesus' time, there was a fortress. There was a fortress or a castle on top of that mountain. So when you read the text, it's very clear that Jesus and these men were alone. They were not anywhere near a fortress. And then when you look at the geographical location of where Jesus is right before this story and where he is right after this, it all lends itself to this mountain. Why they think it's the other mountain, I don't really know. Um, I didn't really find a, a, a writer that would give me a clear answer as to why. But suffice it to say that this is the mountain that they are on. From this point forward, it changes the name of the mountain. And it becomes known as the Mount of Transfiguration. And then Peter, in 2 Peter, he references, at, he references it as that holy mount. That holy place. It forever, this experience forever changes this mountain in the lives of everyone that was there and everyone that talked about it and everyone that heard about it. And I believe that God is calling some of us young people, I believe that God is calling all of us young people to some mountains of transfiguration. He's calling us to some places that when we walk away from that place, we are never the same. We never refer to that service the same. We never refer to ourselves the same. Nothing about us is the same. When we walk down from that place, when we come out of that spiritual place with God, everything has changed. Nothing is the same from that day forward. Nothing is the same from that day forward. And so... Jesus, actually in verse 26, or in verse 28 of the previous chapter, uh, this, this statement intrigues me. And, and really this is probably where this was born out of, is this, this statement that Jesus makes and, and trying to find, trying to put my finger on, on the pulse of prophecy and understand where was this verse fulfilled. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And if we're not careful when we read over that, it doesn't make sense because when we think of that, we think of the second coming of Christ. Well, that can't be so because all of the apostles are dead and the second coming of Christ hasn't happened yet. So we have to dig a little bit deeper. What is this verse talking about? And once again... As it often is when you read commentaries, they're all over the place. This guy thinks this, and this guy thinks that, and oh man, it's just so much fun. And I argue with all of them, because I can. I write all over the books, unless they're Bishop's books, then I don't write in them. Then I put sticky notes in them, and if you look at some of his books, there's sticky notes all over his books, because of me not wanting to write on his books. But... Uh, and I, I don't know that I've come to the complete answer that I'm looking for. I do believe personally that some of this verse is fulfilled in chapter 17. But I don't know that all of it is fulfilled in chapter 17. And then I believe that some of it is fulfilled in First Peter or, or in Second Peter, the first chapter. As the Apostle Peter, he begins to write about this. And he makes mention that we see the kingdom of God ever expanding and never ending. And then right after that, young people, he begins to talk about this holy mount. He begins to talk about this very instance. I believe that that is some of the fulfillment of this. I believe that some of the fulfillment, probably the most potent fulfillment of this verse is the Apostle John. Nobody saw Jesus coming in all of his glory more vividly than John when he stepped into the revelation. So while I begin to unpack this, suddenly the Holy Ghost began to talk to me about the next chapter. And so that's where we're going to focus tonight and maybe when, if I ever figure out all the answers of, of the previous verse, we'll come back and preach about it. But... The Holy Ghost began to talk to me, young people, because every single one of us in this house tonight are called to be great. Every single one of us, we are not called to be average. We are not called to just fit in. People feel like, well, I stick out, especially as a young person. You feel like, well, I don't fit in. 
And I understand the battle of that. Young ladies, young men, you want to fit in. You want, you want to find a place. But really, God has not called you to fit in with the crowd. God has called each and every one of us to step up out of the crowd. To step out of everything around us. To step out of the comfort zone. And to step into the call of God. You're not called to be average. You're not called to be the gray man at school or the gray lady at school that nobody knows who you are and nobody knows your name and nobody knows what you stand for. That's not what you're called to be on the job. That's not why God filled you with the Holy Ghost. If God wanted you to be average, he would have never filled you with the Holy Ghost. God doesn't create average things. He creates Great things. He creates mighty things. God does exceeding abundantly above all I could ask or think. If we're not careful, young people, we get caught up in this wanting to fit in. And wanting to be in the crowd. And wanting to, no, don't notice me. I don't want anybody to to notice me. And at the same time, you want everyone to notice you. It's the torn world of being a young person. You don't want to be noticed and you want to be noticed. You want to fit in and you don't want to fit in. And you find this struggle amongst the apostles. Many of the apostles were very young. And and you hear ages kicked around and, and we don't really know. We do know that Simon Peter possibly and probably was one of the oldest ones because the Bible mentions that he was married. And that's what they base that off of. We know he was married from one of the writings of the Apostle Paul. And then when Jesus heals his mother-in-law, we know that Peter was married. And that's all we really know. We don't know if he had children. We know he was connected to a fishing business. He was connected to the sons of Zebedee. And Zebedee had a house in Jerusalem. So he was probably a little bit better off, maybe middle class or upper, upper middle class. And this is kind of how we figure this stuff out. But the rest of the apostles were young. Probably teenagers. And so you see this this fighting and, and this misunderstanding amongst them all the time. Who will be the greatest? And then yet when Jesus asks a question, nobody wants to speak up. The intimidation of, I want to be noticed, but then when the pressure's on. Like if I started asking questions tonight, it would just... You want to be noticed until it's time to be noticed. And then you're like, oh, I don't, no, I don't, I don't want to. I'll just be quiet. In fact... Oftentimes, the only one who would really answer boldly and just step forward, even times he would put his foot in his mouth, but it's Peter. In fact, in this very, in this very encounter in the Mount of Transfiguration, I like how one, I, I believe it was the premier study Bible, I may be confusing it with another one, but they said that it is interesting that Peter always felt like he had to say something. So even, and the Bible's very clear here, he did not know what to say, but he still said something. We've all been there before where we, we, we stick our foot in our mouth and we're embarrassed. But you have to see this young man, young lady, that these, these disciples are called to be great. Jesus knows. The disciples don't fully grasp this yet, especially in this text. But Jesus knows. I have three Maybe six, three to six years that I will spend with these young men. And then I am leaving earth. I won't come back until the end of time. Until the end of all things. And if these young people do not get this, then this thing will fail. That is the spirit that Jesus is teaching with. That is the drivenness, the zeal that is upon Jesus. That these young people have got to get this. These young men have got to understand. Young people, you've got to understand that if you don't get this, uh, Christian Growth Center will not live past you. It'll die. My generation and the generation that's in front of us, it'll die. It'll go away. It is behooving. It is is of immense value and weight that we get this, young people. That we understand the call. That you're called to be great. That you're called to do great things. You're called to lay hands on the sick. And they recover. You're called to cast out devils. You're called to walk upon serpents and scorpions. You're called to walk into the schools and the jobs of this city. And proclaim the gospel. And bring peace to the tormented. And bring victory to the defeated. And bring peace to those that are in torment. 
They've got to get this. And so one of the places that I begin to really search, I begin to ask myself, God, what is the purpose of the Mount of Transfiguration? I understand some. I don't know that I understand all. I understand some of what happened on that mountain. And there's great revelation and there's so much type and shadow on that mountain that you cannot talk about it all. You, you could not preach it. You could preach a whole month of services on everything, all of the type and all of the shadow. All the way back to Sinai and all the way back to the temple and the glory of God and the, and the, the embodiment of God. The presence, knowing the presence of God was somewhere. It's, it's so much packed into this, just a few verses. You can't talk about it all. But why did this happen? Why did this happen? And so, I believe that's what led me to chapter 16, verse 28. That's part of why this happened, I believe. But also part of it is Jesus needing His disciples to begin to grasp very quickly who He is. And what He is here to do. And what He has been sent to do. And there's other things like Jesus is led up of the devil into a mountain. But just before this, Jesus looks at Simon and says, get behind me, Satan. And then he leads Simon up into this mountain. So much here. But really tonight, we're, we'll talk a little bit about what happens on the mountain. But really, we're going to talk about the mountain itself for just a few more minutes. And then we'll wrap it up and, and, and let the Holy Ghost do the rest. You know, young people... These disciples, whether they realized it or not, when Jesus began to pick them, Jesus was not picking them for just an easy task. Some of you in the school, you've never gone on a hike, but from what I heard this year, you may get privileged to go on a hike. And you're going to realize that some hikes are easier than others. But Jesus was calling specific disciples to climb the highest mountain in the entire nation with him. That would be like Bishop coming down here or another great man of God coming down here and saying, hey, I, I need you three right here. I need you to meet me tomorrow morning and uh, just meet me at the church and then we're going to just take a little car ride and then he shows up at Pike's Peak and he says, all right, let's climb it. That involves work. That's hard. You don't just do that in an hour. Well, most people. You don't just do that an hour unless you've trained for it. Unless you've practiced for that. Unless you've put in the work, young man. Unless you've done the reps, young men. Unless you've put in the cardio. Unless you've built your lungs to where you can just go up and up and up. And the lack of oxygen, as the oxygen level gets lower and lower, it doesn't begin to get to your head. I remember the first time I went to Pikes Peak, I got altitude sickness. And I've lived in Colorado my whole life. But going up that fast, that, that many thousands of feet that fast, it even affected me. God did not call these disciples to just do easy things. And God did not call this youth group to do easy things. God didn't call us to just slide by in life. God didn't call us to just take the easy way in life. I know that this is confrontational a little bit. But this is the cry of the Holy Ghost coming out of this preacher tonight. That God didn't call you to do easy. God didn't call you to do average. God didn't call you to be a no name. Nobody that nobody ever. You don't affect anybody. You don't change anybody. God did not call you to do that. And these apostles, they don't even know it. But climbing a mountain is hard work. You can't be afraid to sweat, young man, when you climb a mountain. You can't be afraid of just the pressure, young lady, when you climb a mountain. It's hard work to climb a mountain. you got to know what you're doing or you have to follow someone that knows what they are doing when you begin to climb a mountain. And it's the same way in the spirit. As we begin to climb to the heights that God is taking us to. As we begin to climb to those heights. It is, uh, it is imperative. It is of the, 
the weight is, I don't even know the right word to use to describe to you the weight and the seriousness that you follow your leaders, that you get your eyes off of everyone else around you. Somebody's always going to have an opinion, young man. Somebody's always going to have advice, young lady. But when you begin to climb this mountain, Peter and James and John didn't need to look down to Bartholomew and look over to Matthew and look over to Judas and look over to Thaddeus. No, they needed to keep their eye on Jesus. Young men, there's some places that God's going to take us when you're going to just have to shut the voices off because they're telling you to do something that the man of God is not saying. It doesn't mean you hate them. It doesn't mean you curse them. But you've got to keep your eyes on the leader. You get distracted climbing a mountain and you're not paying attention to what you're doing and you'll fall. And sometimes it's just a little fall. Sometimes you stumble and you say, well, that was a close one. And you get back up. But when you reach very precarious places on a mountain, if you fall, you will die. You will fall for hundreds, sometimes thousands of feet. And you will never recover. You will be so broken and so busted up because you weren't paying attention. You weren't paying attention to the leadership. You weren't paying attention to the voice of God. But if you do it right, if you do it right, then you get to see some special things. Not everyone goes to the mountaintop. It's just Peter and James and John. I don't understand why. I, I, it's, it's sometimes it's so humor. Sometimes you find the most profound things in commentaries. And then sometimes you find stuff where you're like, what are you talking about? And that's kind of how I felt when they begin to talk about this. Well, you know, Judas and, and oh, I mean, obviously we know Judas, he's going to betray him. Well, duh, he didn't pick him. But we don't really know why he didn't pick him. We don't really know why. For whatever reason, it was Peter and James and John. And, and they talk about how Peter's the rock and James and John are the sons of thunder. Maybe it was their just their, their get after it attitude. Maybe that's what it was. But Jesus doesn't tell us what it was. He just looks at him and says, Peter and James and John, follow me. And they just take off in the evening time. In the, Oh, God help me. In the evening time to climb a mountain. Young people, we're living in the last days. We are living in the evening time. And when it gets dark and when it gets... The sun begins to go down. It gets harder and harder to pay attention where your feet are. Yeah. But thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Young man, you need advice? Get back in the word of God. Young lady, you need advice? Get back in the word of God. Get back in the prayer room. Push the plate away. Fast another day. Pray another hour. Not everyone goes to the mountaintop. I don't know why. I don't understand why. I don't understand what it is about some people that they're just okay. I know what it's like to be tired, but they're not just tired. They're okay with where they're at. There's no drive. There's no push. There's no call from destiny. Not everybody makes it to the Mount of Transfiguration. You read about the rest of the disciples. They were down with the crowd. Right back what we talked about. They wanted to fit in. They're with the crowd. They're with a great multitude. That's what it means. That's where everybody's at. Well, well, preacher, that's where all the fun is. And, and if I fast, I can't go out to eat. Or, or maybe it's too hard when I fast to go out to eat. So, so I'll just fast later in life. And instead of pushing back the plate, you're pushing back the call of destiny in your life. Well, preacher, I want to do what God called me to do, but, you know, I'm going to go and get my degree and get a good job and, and get married and have a couple kids, and then I'll come back to the call of God. No, no, no. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. That's not my words. That's the words of Jesus. I know that's harsh, but we don't have much time left. And Jesus is looking for people at the evening time where he can walk up to you and say, Young man, I know you're only 10 years old, but I need you to teach a Bible study. Get out in the field, young man, and preach the word of God. Young lady, I know you're only 7, 8 years old, but I need you to fast. And I need you to pray until the chains are broken. Not everybody makes it to the mountaintop. There's all kinds of reasons why. Some people get hurt. Some people get bitter. 
Some people, they just want to sin, and so they give up on living for God. Some people don't have the drive, and some people do, but they don't have the leadership to get them to the top. There's all kinds of reasons why people don't climb the mountain. But you got to make up in your mind, young man, I'm going to the top of the mountain if I'm the only one that follows Jesus to the top. I will see the glory of God. Not everybody goes to the top of the mountain. And we already talked about this, but it's dangerous when you climb a mountain. There's places in your walk with God when it's going to become dangerous. And God's going to take you to precarious places. And if you have the wrong voices, you'll fall. And if you're not praying, you'll backslide. But the only way to get to where God wants you to go is to step out into the deep of God. It's scary. You walk alone. Nobody's with you. Guess what? Sometimes you just cry yourself to sleep. And then sometimes you want to cry yourself to sleep and you tell yourself, suck it up, young man, because I'm a man of God and I control my emotions. Your emotions don't control you, young men. You control your emotions. There's times when everything inside of you is going to say, quit, Brother Silas. It's going to say, quit. It's going to say, be average. It's going to say, quit learning that language. It's going to say, quit pushing for greatness. And somewhere you've got to realize that that is the voice of the enemy. And my emotions do not control me. So I'm going to push even when my emotions say push. And I'm going to get up and praise when my emotions say sit there. And I'm going to fast when my emotions say eat. And I'm going to pray. When my emotions say just stay in bed Just sleep another hour It's not about my emotions It's about the call of God Not everybody makes it to the top It's dangerous Some people don't start And some people never finish But if you don't go to the mountain Young lady You'll never see his glory. Oh, you'll see the miraculous. He comes down off this mountain and does the miraculous. He does the miraculous before he goes up this mountain. In fact, the last, the last miracle he does before setting his face towards Jerusalem is when he comes off the mountain. You'll see the miraculous. You'll see it. But you won't see his glory. You won't see... You won't see Elijah and Elisha, or Elijah and Moses. You won't see Elijah and Moses, Moses representing the law, and Elijah representing the prophets, and the beautiful and powerful type and shadow that happens when you have the law and the prophets meet with Jesus and then they both disappear which represents to the disciples from here moving forward if you want us to speak we are going to speak through Jesus you'll never see that there's revelations you'll never touch you'll hear men and women of God talk and you won't understand what they're talking about it's not because God don't want you to understand but it's because somewhere you gotta buckle down and really learn to pray somewhere you gotta buckle down and really learn to worship somewhere you gotta buckle down and learn to be a man of God learn to be a woman of God if I don't go I'll never see the glory I'll never see, I'll never see where the cloud that represents the Shekinah, that's, that's a word that, that, that the rabbis came up with to, to try and describe. They were trying to describe the, the presence of God, the embodiment of God in the Old Testament. And so they would use the word Shekinah. So when the, when the glory cloud would come down on the temple, that was the Shekinah. And, and in, in, when Solomon dedicates the temple, it says that they couldn't, even, they couldn't even work in the temple because the glory had filled that place so strong. Young man, you'll never... I've heard stories all my life of, of looking up and seeing the glory of God. You'll never see that if you don't get it in your spirit that I'm going to the mountain that there's some things that you just won't do young lady because it's not in you and it's not in me it's the places we let him take us 
When we let God crucify us and we let God drive the knife into us and cut those things out and it hurts, it hurts so bad you can't describe it. And you watch people you love talk about you and ridicule you and stab you in the back and God tells you turn the other cheek and everything inside you wants to stand up and fight. But if I fight them, I can't go to the mountain. And so you forgive them and you just keep walking. It's not because they really hate you. I mean, sometimes it is, but really, really a lot of times it's just because you're misunderstood. They don't understand that you don't think you're better than anyone else. If you do, you're not going to the mountain. If you're full of pride, you're not going to get selected to go to the mountain. You won't even fall near the qualifications. But some people think that you're prideful. No, I know, I know that, I know that I've got to stay submitted to God. But I know, Silas, if I don't get up and I don't pray, I'll never do anything for God. So it's not that I think I'm better than you. I just understand that if I'm going to get to where he's calling me, I'm going to have to do some things whether you do it or not. Musicians, please come. You can't be afraid of the mountain, young people. I know it's scary. I know it looks so big you think I'll never get to the top. Yes, you will. Stop talking like that. You'll get to the top. Yes, you're going to fall. Yes, he's going to have to pick you up. Yes, you're going to get lost and he's going to come back and find you. But you remember young th- one thing, young man. You remember one thing, young lady. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And no matter who says what or who does what or what happens, just keep walking with Jesus until you reach the top of the mountain and you see the fire fall and you see the voice of God boom from heaven as he says, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And you encounter the revelation of the Lord. And you encounter the revelation of the prophets. And then there's going to come a time. When Jesus taps you on the shoulder. And you've seen all the glory. And you've seen all the power. And you've seen all the splendor. And you feel like Moses. That he, that he hid you in a cleft in the rock. And he walked by you. And he proclaimed the Lord God. Strong and mighty and merciful. You feel that. And then young person is going to tap you on the shoulder. And say "All right," And you're going to look up. And it's not going to be this magnificent thing. It's just going to be Jesus. He says "All right, Peter, James and John. Let's go back down the mountain. And Peter says no no what do you mean? What do you mean Jesus? No stop. Stop everything. We got to build three tabernacles. That's where Peter stuck his foot in his mouth. Because you can't live on the mountaintop, young man. you got to take what God gives you there. And you've got to wrestle it down from heaven into your life. And then you've got to walk off that mountain back to everyone that didn't walk up the mountain with you. And you've got to look at them and say, God wants you to go up the mountain. And God wants you to be delivered. And when he came off the mountain with the three disciples, he had nine disciples. That had been trying the whole time to cast a devil out. And they couldn't do anything. Sometimes young people you're going to walk off the mountain right into a mess. Into a complete mess. Into chaos. There's too much to preach here. That's why I said there's so much type and shadow. Jesus walks off the mountain into a mess of a man that's possessed with a devil. And Moses walks off the mountain into people worshiping idols. And both of them get mad. Moses gets mad and he breaks the tablets of stone. And Jesus gets frustrated and he says, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long must I suffer you? How long am I going to have to put up with this? Where's your son? And he casts the devil out. And the rest of the disciples are confused. How come we couldn't cast him out? And you know it. We say it almost every Sunday night. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Another sermon for another time. What about this whole thing about a mustard seed? The title is The Mountain and the Mustard Seed. And I've come to talk to some young people tonight. Now hear me. Now I don't say anything because it's not my place. But when people preach this 
wrong. I don't get mad. But I understand that you have missed what is really being said. This account is not about the size of the mustard seed. There's other places where it talks about the size. And in fact, I read a newer translation and that's what they said. And I was like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? When Jesus comes off this mountain and he talks about faith and the mustard seed, it has nothing to do with how little the mustard seed and everything to do with how great the faith is inside of the mustard seed. That's what this is about. Jesus just took his disciples up a mountain that, and they saw things that without him they could have never done and could have never seen. And then he looks at them and says, if ye have faith as the mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And we think, what does all that mean? And like I said, some, some of us, if we're not careful, and I've done it too. I've probably preached about it before. Some of us, if we're not careful, we, we talk about, well, this, the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. And there is another place in the Bible where it talks about just that. But not here. It is the smallest of all seeds. And you look at them and they're tiny. And we, and we focus on that. The mustard seed is so tiny, but God wants to make it so great. And we're missing what Jesus is saying. Young man, he's saying... He's saying that if you can get on the mountain and you can really see God, I mean really see Him. I mean to where you feel Him standing in the room. I mean to where it scares the fire out of you because you know, you know with everything inside of you, God is in this room. And then you come off the mountain and you walk back into the mess of your life and you walk back into a broken home and you walk back into a disrupted family and you walk back into chaos. There's, you will find something inside of you that is so great that it scares you that you can look at anything and say, move. And this is the power of the mustard seed. Let's say, the power of the mustard seed is that you take this tiniest of seeds, kind of wish I had one today, and you plant it stick it down in the dirt and you cover it up and you cover it up and you put all this stuff on it and the mustard seed is buried and that's where some of us feel we're at right now you feel buried you know God's called you you know you're supposed to be great but you look at the mountain you say how in the world there's no way and there isn't Unless Jesus leads you. But the faith inside that seed is so great. Now, it's not a mountain to us. It's just a pile of dirt. But when you're, you know, way less than a gram. And you're only so, you know, like maybe, I don't even know. Probably littler than a milliliter across. A millimeter, not a milliliter. Yeah, you weigh less than a milliliter. I paid attention to Brother Hicks. In school, I paid attention, I promise. But there is something so great in that seed, young person, that it doesn't matter how much dirt is piled on it. That mustard seed just keeps digging. And it just keeps pushing. And it just keeps shoving the dirt aside. Because there's something so great inside of that mustard seed that it doesn't matter how many feet of dirt you put on its head. If you just keep pushing, just like the mustard seed somewhere, there's coming a day when that mustard seed breaks out of the ground. And then Jesus said it becomes the greatest of all the herbs. Young man, I'm preaching to some of you. You don't even realize the potential inside of you. The greatness inside of you. But God sent me here to shake you up and to rattle your world. And to say, just keep digging. Young man, some of you are getting up to pray. Keep getting up to pray. Get up and pray. 
It don't matter if nobody picks you up. Get up and pray. If nobody walks foot in this sanctuary, you walk foot in this sanctuary and you pray. Why? Because it doesn't. I can't dig you out and you can't dig me out. There's got to be a fight, a fire, something inside of you that says, I will go to the mountain. It's not even in my notes, but Jesus says, and it, 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 I believe it's actually the writer of Hebrews, I could be wrong, but they say that God has given to every man, every man, every person. You know, well, I don't have faith. Yes, you do. You do have faith. You may have lost it. You may have misplaced it. You, it may be dormant. It may, it may be on the verge of dying. But the Bible says that God has given to everyone the measure of faith. The same potential for greatness. Uh, the same call to destiny. The same anointing to be all that God has called you to be, young man. It's in you. You just got to dig around until you find it. Uh, and then you got to water it in fasting. And you got to water it in praying. Uh, and you got to water it in consecration. And then you go back and you dig a while. You get in the Word of God and you dig it out. And I close with this. And, I, and you can read this in several places, but I'm reading it in Luke because in the gospel of Luke, Jesus, for whatever reason, Luke quotes Jesus as being very specific with this call. And I don't have time to preach this, but even in Luke, this is just before they go up the mountain. This is literally five verses before the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus looks at his disciples and he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke's the only one that says it like that. You can get into the Greek and you can begin to study what it means to deny yourself. It means to totally refute and reject yourself. To look at every part of your life and every part of your being and say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to go up the mountain. you got to reject Everything that you want to do, young man, oh, sure, somewhere it might fall into the call of God. But it's not about that. If I get to do some things I like along the way, great. But if I live my entire life wondering, God, what are you doing with me? As long as I fulfill the will of God. And that's what it takes, young person to get up the mountain do you have what it takes do you have the guts young lady to pray and fast and plead and, and crawl and beg and fight and claw your way up the mountain young man do you have what it takes to deny yourself and shut the phone off and put the video games aside do you have that in you I know you do but you gotta realize you do I know it's there. Bishop knows it's there. Every man of God or woman of God in this sanctuary knows it's there. But do you know it's there? Have you heard the voice of God say, young man, come away with me into the mountain? If you're in this sanctuary tonight, young person, and you don't want to be average, then why don't you come down to this altar and begin to climb that mountain tonight? Don't just come down here and say, oh God, I love you, Jesus, and go home and eat it wherever you're going to eat. But come down to this altar and begin to ask God, okay, God, where, where do I start climbing this mountain? What is the first step? What is the first thing that I have to bring into my life? What is the first thing that has to go out of my life, God? I don't want to be average. I don't want to just be a good saint and nothing more. I want to be a good saint. I just preached about being a saint. You got to be a saint. But I want to be so much more, God. Come on, young lady. Climb the mountain. Stop making excuses. Stop running from the call. Stop hiding. Stop pushing it off to somebody else. Gird up the loins of your mind, young man. Stop pushing it off. I'll do it next week. I'll do it next month. No, I'll start tonight. And by next year, I'll be halfway up the mountain.
Come on, young people. I know it's in you. God knows it's in you. He put it there. It's there. Just find it. Just believe in it. Just put your faith back in it. Just, just get it back to God. Get it back to a prayer room. Say, preacher, my parents aren't doing it. No, no, no. You're thinking about this wrong. Just do it anyway. Who knows? You may be the one that teaches your parents to do it. You say, well, my kids aren't doing it. No, no, no. Just do it anyway. Well, my family's not. No. Stop thinking about everybody else and just answer God's call on your life.
on, if you're finished praying, why don't you just stand to your feet and lift your hands and let's pray with these others as they pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's pray with these as they pray. Let's don't be selfish. If they're praying, then they need our help to pray. The Bible says to lift up the hands of them that hang down. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Blessed be your name, God. Blessed be your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Now here's, I only want you to do this if you're sincere, young man and young lady. If you're not, don't do this. I'm tired of leaders making people do stuff they don't want to do. This is, a, this is with all your heart, not because I told you to do it. I think that's a lot of problems in the church today as people are doing it out of coercions, not necessarily from the leader, but coercions of peer pressure, coercions. There's many kinds of coercions. But if you really mean it, I want you to raise your hands right now and close your eyes. And I want you to ask God to reveal himself to you. Can you do that right now? Out loud. If you really want him to, God, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you reveal your ways to me? Would you reveal your word to me? I want to know you, Jesus. Come on. I want to know you, Jesus. I really want to know you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God. Praise God. Brother Mitchell touched on something that is one of the most revelatory things that God's ever showed me out of his word. If you're in this church, you've heard me refer to this so much. And that is the power of that seed. Because God likens two things to a mustard seed. He likens your faith to a mustard seed. And he likens the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, which relates them. They're synonymous. And what Brother Mitchell is talking about tonight is the genetic of that seed. It's what it's created to do. It's what its creator or its father or its progenitor created it to do it doesn't have anything to do with the size of that seed it has everything to do with it following the order of its creation so it doesn't matter how long that seed lays there dormant I read here quickly while brother Mitchell was preaching the oldest seed to germinate into a full plant is a 2000 year old date palm seed it was discovered in the 1960s during excavations of Herod the Great's palace in Masada in Israel. I've been to that palace. The seed was preserved in a cool, dry place and germinated in 2005 by Dr. Sarah Salen and Dr. Elaine Soloway. After eight weeks, one of the three seeds planted sprouted, and the resulting plant 
named Methuselah, after the Bible's oldest man, that date palm grew to be over three feet tall. Laid there dormant for 2,000 years. How, how long is the promises and the revelations of God going to lay dormant in your life? He created you for that. You say, oh, there's a mountain. You know, the average seed is planted six to eight inches deep. If that's a mustard seed and there's eight inches of dirt over the top of it, that's like, that's like uh, uh, Pike's Peak being over the top of you. And you can lay there and whine and cry, baby. Talk about how much you can't do anything, but God created you for that. And if you're full of the Holy Ghost, that's double power. Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. How many of you want to do what this man of God preached to us tonight? I want to be who God called me to be. I'm going to the Mount of Transfiguration. I'm going with Jesus Christ. I want him to reveal himself to me. I want to be everything. I'm talking to us older people. We get, we get relaxed and we think, well, we've arrived. We've accomplished everything. No, we haven't. This seed is powerful in our life. There's still ministry that God wants us to do. There's still purpose for our lives. There's still reason for us to be in the kingdom of God. Oh, let's stand and let's give God another high praise. Can we do that? Everybody, let's do that. Come on, let's praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We love you. We thank you. We worship you. We honor your holy name, Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God. Here's the thing you have to be careful of is that the enemy will come in and he will sow terror seeds in your life. And if you're not careful, you'll, you will cultivate the tares in your life more than you will cultivate the promise in your life. Because tares don't take a whole lot to cultivate. How many of you had to go down to Walmart and buy dandelion seeds for your yard? Did anybody have to go to Walmart and buy dandelion? Did anybody have to go to Walmart and buy ragweed for your yard? I, let me tell you something. I have a farm. I have a 75-acre farm. I have cursed the devil every time I go out there and mow those tumbleweeds. Because so I sure didn't plant those tumbleweeds. I hate those tumbleweeds. You know, it doesn't take a lot of discipline to cultivate tares and sloppiness in your life. But if you're going to have the power of God in your life, you have to spend time cultivating that seed and that faith and that kingdom of God in your life. Oh, let's give him another high praise. Can we do that? <laughs> outreach tomorrow, Sister Melody. No outreach tomorrow. Well, there is outreach. We all outreach. How many of you going to invite somebody? I have a Bible study at 5 o'clock tomorrow night, and I'm supposed to baptize my Bible study this weekend. So how many of you help me pray <laughs> that we get it done? <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you. It's so wonderful to have Pastor Williams home with us. Sister Barbara and Brother Randy Williams, God bless them. We're praying for them. Let's remember, Sister Bernice, that God will intervene in this lady's health in Jesus' name. Praise God. And then, Brother and Sister, I think it's Marty. Brother and Sister Marty, Sora, and their children. What a pleasant surprise to walk in here and see them with us on this Friday night youth service. And we're just delighted that they're with us. Amen. We're so glad that you could make it. Praise God. And I'm just uh, ecstatic about this weekend. How many of you are going to invite somebody to church Sunday? God's doing great things. Let's not forget that. God bless you. Love one another. You're dismissed.